We'll be reading this morning from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 24. That will bring us to the end of chapter 3. We'll leave off in 1 John for a little while there as we enter into the Advent season. We'll focus a bit more on that, and then, Lord willing, we'll come back to chapters 4 and 5 sometime after the new year. And so we'll be finishing chapter 3 here this morning. You can find the beginning of our passage on page 1901, again reading from verses 11 to 24. Before we read that, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, your word is perfect, and the things that it speaks are perfect. And as this is so, we pray that you would lead us in our hearts, our minds, our thoughts to Christ, who is himself perfect and the perfect example of love. We pray that you would fill us with this truth, that it would transform our lives, that we would be transformed all the more into the image of Christ. Even this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in His presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and He knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask, because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us. One of the most soul-gripping and important questions that is ever asked in the Scriptures is the question of the Philippian jailer, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You may, you may know the, the story, you may know the context. Uh, Paul and Silas are in prison in Philippi. Paul found himself in prison an awful lot. And as they're in prison, they're singing, they're doing what they always do in prison, which is worshiping. And there they are, and in the night, an earthquake hits, and it opens the doors of the jail. And the jailer awakes, the jailer who's responsible, of course, for keeping them in jail, awakes and sees the doors open and be- begins to draw his sword because he's going to kill himself. He knows he's a dead man either way, because if you let a prisoner go free, it was your life for their life. And as he's about to slay himself, Paul and Silas say, stop, don't do it, for we are all here. The man, having received his life, and certainly having heard them singing and praying, and perhaps even having had the gospel shared with him, asked them that powerful question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's a good question to ask if ever there was one. And we know the answer that Paul and Silas give, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. We just read that a few moments ago in the covenant promises before the baptism. Believe, that is, have faith. But what is faith? What is true faith? Well, John begins to answer this in verses 11 
to 15, but if you hop towards the back of the portion for today, towards the end of John 3, verse 23, John says, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. Faith is to believe in the name of Christ, that is to believe that he is the Savior, to believe that he has the power to save, to believe that he is the Son of God, that he is himself perfect. That's what this means, but it is more than that as well. It is to love. This is the command we receive, is to love. And we find this as we move into verses 11 to 15. Again, John says, this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Now, John goes back to this in the beginning motif. John has come to this a number of times. That which was from the beginning, he says, in the very opening part of this letter in chapter 1. And this harkens back to the beginning of John's gospel, which they would have at least heard if they had not read. In the beginning was the Word. And what does that do? That brings us all the way back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John wants to take these Christians in his churches back to the beginning, back to the beginning when he preached the gospel to them, the gospel he preached them about Jesus, who was with the beginning, who was in the beginning with God. And so he says, I'm I'm not teaching you anything new here. I'm not going to give you any kind of new revelation you haven't already heard. I'm just going to bring you back to what I have already preached to you. I have already preached to you the gospel of Jesus Christ, nothing more and nothing less. And you and you may not have anything less and have Christ, and you may not have anything more. You need not anything more to have Christ. And so John brings us then to this to this command as you go back to verse 23 again and as we come again into verse 11, that there is one gospel. There's only one gospel. It's the same gospel he had told them before. But the gospel comes with two commands, and they are two inseparable commands. And Jesus and John the Baptist bring these commands at the beginning of their ministries. They both preach, repent, and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Two commands in one gospel, repent and believe. You you can never have one without the other. You can never have the gospel without a transformed life because to have the gospel means to be filled with the Spirit and the Spirit always leads to a transformed life. But it's impossible to have a transformed life, a truly transformed life, without believing the gospel and being filled with the Holy Spirit. So if we are to repent and believe, we will by necessity do both at the same time. And so we have faith in what is true and that truth transforms us and we live in accordance with us. And that's what John is saying. I am preaching to you a gospel of truth, and this truth requires something of you, and the truth of what I have preached to you causes you to by necessity act in a certain way, and that certain way is to act in love. Now, I I think I jumped the gun a little bit last week. As I talked about Cain and Abel, and since the Spirit-inspired author John waits until this section to speak about Cain and Abel, perhaps I ought to have done the same thing as well. But anyways, we, we come into this, and John uses Cain and Abel as examples that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are two kinds of people, and only two kinds of people, however different it may seem at different times. There are those who belong to the devil who are animated by evil, both internal and external. And there are those who are children of God, who are animated by love, just as God is love. And we see as we come through these verses, verse 14, John says, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. This letter of John is largely a letter of encouragement. 
John wants to encourage his brothers and sisters in the faith, these, these people that he has pastored, or perhaps is even still in some sense pastoring. And they are in need of encouragement, again, because some of these, some of some members of his churches have left, and they've left, and they have claimed in their leaving that they have a, a super spiritual extra knowledge, and they know the true gospel. And because they know this extra knowledge, they are the true Christians, and the ones who have stayed behind in John's original churches are not true Christians. And so John wants these people who are still in the churches that he loves, which he pastored, he wants them to know that they, not those who have left, that they are the true Christians. In order to encourage them in this, he gives them three tests by which a person can know if they are a true Christian. He gives them a doctrinal test. A person must confess the Son of God, that Christ is the Son of God. You cannot deny Jesus and be a Christian. And then he gives them as well a moral test, that one must walk in the light as God is in the light. You cannot follow Christ and make a life of habitual, unrepentant sin. But then there is a third test, which is the social test. If you are a true Christian, you will love, you will love, and you will particularly love others who are in the church. And so this, this social test is giving is giving the churches kind of a diagnostic test. How is it that we can diagnose specifically, not necessarily who is a Christian, but very easily who is not a Christian? And the formula goes something like this, no love, no Jesus, no eternal life. And he wants them to know this because those who have left have certainly not loved. And he says, do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. And so we should read all of this in context again, because John is not saying and saying that we should love one another and that those who love are Christians. He's not saying that every single person who ever does an act of love is a Christian. You may very well do an act of love or even multiple acts of love, but if you don't confess Christ and if you generally walk in the darkness, then you do not have Christ. But what he's saying is very concretely, if you do not love then you are not a Christian. John means to apply this to his readers. And he specifically applies it in the context of love and hate. And in this, we see again two kinds of people. There are those who follow in the steps of Cain, and there are those who follow in the steps of Abel. Abel being righteous, Cain being unrighteous. You know, something that I think is, is a little easy to pass over in the Cain and Abel account is that they both bring sacrifices. They both at least go through the motions of bringing something to God. They, they both acknowledge at least externally that God is worthy of receiving something from them. But one is full of love, genuine love for God, and one is full of hatred, which includes hatred of his brother. And Cain, being filled with hatred and being envious because his brother actually had a right heart, he murders his brother. He demonstrates that hatred leads to murder. And this is what John says as well. And John doesn't get this from himself, that he who hates his brother is a murderer. Jesus taught that in Matthew 5. If you have hated your brother in your heart, you have committed murder against him. But the sixth commandment does not apply only to those who would shed the literal physical blood of another person. That hatred itself is murder. And we know from the scriptures, as John says, that no murderer has eternal life in him. So what is love, though? We know that that's what hatred is. Now what is love? We'll get that in verses 16 to 18. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. I wonder if you just took these verses and you came to kind of your, your average Christian, 
and you read these verses and you said, guess what book of the Bible these verses are from, I, I think you would get a lot of guesses that would say these verses are from James. Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions. Isn't that sound very similar to what James says? Faith without works is dead. He speaks about caring for the widow and the orphan. And John and James have very similar messages, and, and Paul does as well. And Why is this? Well, because they're inspired by the same Spirit, and they're working off the same material. They're all teaching what Jesus taught. And so as Jesus teaches about true love for neighbors, so too John and James speak about true love for neighbor. But something we often miss in this is who specifically John and James address as the recipients of our love. And that is the recipients of our love ought to be first and foremost our brothers, that is other Christians. James makes the same point. He says that our priority in love should be the brothers and the sisters in the faith. And Jesus makes the same point. Lest you think that John or James are being uh, sort of inward looking or insular, Jesus makes the same point as well. We can read about this, and I'll read this from Matthew 25, 31 to 33, and 41 to 46. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then He will say to those on His left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked, or sick or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Jesus so closely identifies himself with his people that when his people are oppressed or when they are not cared for, it is as if one is oppressing or not caring for Christ. Jesus so deeply identifies his people that when you love someone who belongs to him, it is in fact that you are loving Christ. Jesus says this as well when he confronts Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul on his way to persecute the church even more. What does Jesus say? Does he say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my people? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? No, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And why does he say that? He's, he's ascended in glory. He's untouchable. But it's because he so closely associates himself with his church that whatever one does against his church, one does against Christ. And whatever one does for his church, one does for Christ. That doesn't mean that we exclude ourselves from all acts of mercy towards those outside the church. Certainly not. But what it does mean is that our first focus is on meeting the needs of one another. And if that seems to be inward focused, or if that seems to be uh, it's a lack of compassion or whatever it may be, your problem is not with me, of course, it is with the Scriptures, and more particularly, it is with Jesus, and you can take it up with Him. But we see in this what perhaps is a, a message which is countercultural to modern evangelicalism. Because modern evangelicalism can oftentimes fall into the trap of having a sort of tunnel vision, and in our tunnel vision, we become obsessed or overly fixated on those who are outside of the church. And we become the kind of people who will do anything it takes to get people inside of the church. And so all of our efforts or almost all of our resources are expended to out there. And we forget in here. And it's a real tragedy 
when we spend so much time and effort trying to get people in here and then we forget about them once they're in here because we just want to go out and get the next one. And I wonder, and I've said this before, I wonder if we would have more people who actually want to be in here, so to speak, if we demonstrated very plainly that we love each other. The early church did not have a problem having people who wanted to come into the church. They actually had a problem with being able to provide for all the people who wanted to come into the church. There were lines of people waiting to come into the church. Some churches made you wait two or three years to prove that you actually believed in Christ before you could actually come into the church. I, I do not advocate for that, but I want to use that as a point, which is that the early church loved each other so effectively that people knew that they wanted wanted to be part of that. And so we see here that James and John, together with Jesus, advocate for the necessity of loving each other in the church. Now, I want to take a moment for encouragement while I'm on the topic. And I I want to say as a word of encouragement that in the seven and a half years, or, or very near to it, that I have been here, I have observed a lot of love between people in this church. Now, you know this as well as I do. I I get to observe the interactions of the officers, the elders and the deacons in the church uh, more closely than I do other interactions because we meet together and I have opportunity to see closer up. And what I have seen in in the years I have been here is I have seen men who have a desire to love the persons of this church and who have had a desire to serve and to meet the needs of the persons of this church, whether it's visiting someone who has recently lost a loved one, or whether it's meeting the needs of somebody who can't make rent or a mortgage payment, or whether it's sitting with somebody who is sick or praying with somebody before they go in for a surgery. I have seen the the men of this church rise to the occasion and to show love, and I'm very grateful for that. And I have, of course, my observations are not limited to that, But there are many, many expressions of love and devotion and affection one for another, which I have observed, which demonstrate a true, genuine love for the brothers and sisters. We should be encouraged by this. This demonstrates, indeed, that Christ is present among the members of the church. I want you to be encouraged by that. That was the theme, right? That's the theme of John's letter is encouragement. I want you to be encouraged by that. And so let this be sort of a a holy pep talk a holy a slap in the backside to say, hey, keep it up. Keep up the good work. And perhaps it should be an encouragement for some of us who have not been regularly engaged in the work to become, to become active in serving and loving and meeting the needs one for another. Maybe a, a baptism this morning is a good opportunity to see the necessity for this. Sometimes when we have people stand up in front of the congregation, and then the congregation stands, and they say those two rich words, we do. I wonder how many people actually mean we do. It would actually be better if you don't just to stay seated and keep your mouth closed. Do we really mean we do? Will we really come along the parents and serve in a way that helps them? Will we, will we volunteer to teach Sunday school if Sunday school needs to be taught? And if it needs to be taught by somebody who actually knows the Bible, will we invest ourselves in knowing the Bible so we can teach the kids in the Sunday school in a way that actually benefits them? Do we actually, do we actually have a desire to love like we say we love? If you don't, this is a good opportunity to do. And if you do... Praise God for you, and praise God for the work that he has already done in your life. Well, Jesus presents the perfect example of love. John says this again, going back to his gospel, John 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John says then, in the portion we just read, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. Laying down our lives has a sort of dramatic appeal to us. Maybe it conjures up images in our minds of war movies and and the hero, the grenade comes into the trench or into the foxhole, the hero throws himself on the grenade and saves his buddies. Now that is, of course, an act of great love and affection. And that stirs kind of our, our nostalgia, but perhaps what is more difficult 
and certainly less thrilling to our emotions is a day out, a day in, a day out, regular, mundane life of self-sacrificing love. John Stott said it this way, Not many of us are called to lay down our lives in some deed of heroism, but we constantly have the more prosaic opportunity to share our possessions with those in need. Isn't that what John says? You come into this, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? James says the same thing, James chapter 2, verses 14 to 19. What good is it, my brothers? If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical gift for their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, I have faith. You have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. The nostalgia of great acts of heroism can be overwhelming. But not many of us would watch a movie consisting of a person who lives an everyday, ordinary life doing regular acts of little service when the need arises. That doesn't draw us in, but you know, that is the ordinary Christian experience. The ordinary Christian experience is one of regular day in and day out self-sacrifice. Following Jesus, who says, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross. And the regular day in, day out cross-bearing marks out a Christian. John offers that as a test of a true Christian. James does the same thing. Jesus did the same thing. And, and, but they're not the only ones. The Old Testament does as well. You go back to the law. You know, the, the law gets a really bad rap. It's this difficult, stern document. But you, you should know this. The law of Moses is the most merciful and humanizing ancient document known to man. And part of that comes in, in sort of the, the moral underpinning, the moral foundation of the law. And we see an example of that in Deuteronomy 15, verses 7 to 9. Moses says, If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites, Israelites being the church of the day, in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year of for canceling debts is near. Remember the seventh year, every seventh year, the Israelites canceled all debts, and the people went back and they had their land and a way to provide for themselves again. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. The seventh year, the year for canceling debts is near so that you do not show ill will toward the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Again, John is giving these tests. You have to believe the right things. You have to believe the truth. You have to believe in Christ, yes. And you have to walk not in unrepentance and you have to walk in the light, yes. But you also must love. Again, remember what James says. He says, even the demons believe there is one God and they shudder. And Jesus comes into that interaction in Matthew 8, verses 28 and 29. He's, he's going along the way. And as he goes along the way, he comes to this area where there are tombs, and there's these two demoniacs. And we, we read this in Matthew 8. Two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Do you see the knowledge of the demons? First, they know that Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, they know that He has the power to torment them. And thirdly, they know that He is the judge. They might very well know more about Christ than we do. But they hated Him. And they hated His people. And because of that, they most certainly do not belong to Him. They are condemned. 
and they do not have eternal life. No, but true faith has legs. True faith has legs that run to meet the needs of the saints, whatever those needs may be. And C.S. Lewis' book, The Great Divorce, you know, I just ordered a whole bunch of copies. I, I make reference to some C.S. Lewis books from time to time. I ordered a bunch of copies of The Great Divorce and the Screwtape Letters. If you want to borrow one, that's fine. Just make sure I get it back. Every once in a while, I loan a book out, and I entirely forget who it is, and I go to look for it on my shelf, and I have no idea where it is because you probably forgot about it too. So if I loan you the book, make sure you get it back. But in The Great Divorce, the, the main gist of the story is that there's a man who takes sort of a, a bus ride from how C.S. Lewis portrays hell, to, to how C.S. Lewis portrays the new creation or heaven. And as he has this, this guide who leads him around this world to see the different things, all of a sudden there is this great parade and all this, all this commotion and there is a, a sort of heavenly chariot and in this heavenly chariot there's a woman and there's children dancing all around. It's a joyful, gleeful scene and the, the main character notices this and he says essentially that woman must have been great and his heavenly guide says yes, she was. And why? Because she cared for the children. Because she looked after the needs of people that nobody else was meeting. You know, being a Christian requires us to reorient our understanding of greatness and what it means to be great. The world esteems the wealthy and the successful. We, we esteem movie stars and professional athletes. We esteem them so highly that we actually sometimes care about their political views. I have often wondered why in the world we take and put any stock in someone who plays a kid's game or plays make-believe for a living. Why it is that I would care about what they say in politics, I have no idea. But regardless, we esteem them very highly. But you know who God esteems highly? God esteems the regular, ordinary Christ follower who loves his people. Being a Christian requires us to reorient our understanding of greatness to mean to, to understand greatness in terms of service and sacrifice rather than celebrity. And now John finishes this chapter, at least as we divide it, in verses 19 to 24. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth, notice the word know, and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Again, you see the word know again. The whole, the whole idea here is around this idea of knowing. How can you know that you are a believer? Well, we know that we are true Christians. Again, if we meet the test of, of, of verse 23, and this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another. Remember, there, are, there is one gospel with two commands, and they are inseparable, to believe in Jesus Christ and to love and to love our brother. And so John again is pointing these Christians back to this truth. How can you know? How can you know they're not the real deal? How can you know that you are the genuine Christian? How can you know they're not the real deal? Because they're haters, we might say. They're frauds. They're, fra they're fakes. They're, they're false Christians. And they demonstrate it by their hatred. And how can you know that you are the real deal? Because you have love. Even they had love for John. The haters, ironically, they, they hated John, which is ironic because Jesus loved John more than anybody else. But these genuine, ordinary, questioning, perhaps doubting Christians, they were the real deal. And John says, how can you know you can know if you pass these tests, if you see the fruit of belonging to Christ? John says something that I'm very hesitant to say. He essentially says, listen to your heart. I hate 
saying, listen to your heart. Because if I listened to my heart, I would be in big trouble. But in this sense, it makes sense. John says to the Christian who has a changed conscience, listen to what your heart says. Do you love your brothers? And do you see fruits of that? Do you see the Spirit at work in your life? Does your conscience, is your conscience at ease with how you love those who are around you in the church? If so, then take this encouragement. And if you have even a doubt in that, if you can see the works of the Spirit, know that God knows everything. And even if your heart should doubt, God does not doubt because He knows and He sees. If you want confidence in Christ, then look and see how it is that you love. Grade yourself by those three tests. Do I believe? Am I walking in the light at least more than I once was? And do I love? John would drive our attention to those three tests to find encouragement. And so I want us to find encouragement that the love of Christ is shown in us in our love for each other. So be encouraged if you are already doing it and encouraged all the more to do it more. We may find more assurance in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, at, at the end of this passage, which is recorded in your word, you make this promise that we receive from you anything we ask because we obey your commands. And we know good and well this doesn't mean that asking for winning lottery tickets or, or new cars or anything. But we know that when we pray for the good of our brother, when we pray for a clean conscience before you, and when these prayers are habitual, not occasional, that you desire to give good things to your people in accordance with your will. So we come in this moment to ask that you would cause us to be a people of love and that when our hearts may doubt, that we would be able to look and see how you work in us by your Spirit and say, though my mind may doubt, yet my heart, yet my heart is confident because if Christ is in me, I have eternal life. God, lead us away from hate. Lead us away from despising our brothers and our sisters. And lead us in to love. Into a love with legs that runs to meet the needs of the saints. And Father, when we see needs that need to be met, perhaps if we are unable to meet them, we ask that you would give us wisdom to know how it is that they may be met. And as a church, we ask that you would cause us to be a merciful people who are quick and ready to love and who celebrate opportunities to give of ourselves and to follow the image and the model of Christ. Lead us in this, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.